In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You might notice in our lessons this morning that there's this wonderful biblical pattern of a call, then resistance, I am not worthy, even Paul in the epistle, God's promise to empower, and then finally simply obedience. Uh, Jesus uh, said to Simon Peter, do not be afraid, henceforth you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. There was an article this week in Christian Today, uh, which is the English version of Christianity Today, and it reports on research that found that Anglicans lack confidence in talking about their faith at all with anyone. The research showed that while 70% of churchgoers could think of someone they could invite to church, between 85 and 90% of these said they had no intention of doing so. Well, here at St. George's, because we uh, are so dedicated to maintaining the best of the Anglican ethos, I would estimate we would fall closer to 99% have no intention of inviting somebody to come to church with them. And because we're an intentional church, we intend not to do things purposefully. In fact, having no intention of doing so is the biblical response, isn't it? The biblical <coughs> formula of a call is exactly that. Call, resistance, God's promise to empower, and finally, obedience. Jesus says many are called, but few are chosen. I have always interpreted that to mean many are called, all resist, but only some trust in God's promise to provide and choose to obey, while the rest choose disobedience. Peter and the rest of the disciples left everything and followed Jesus, but in the story of the rich young man, he could not bring himself to leave everything and follow. And Jesus just let him go away. Jesus said to him, Go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this scripture reports, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Possessed by his possessions is what we like to say about that. Jesus just lets him go. Call, resistance, promise, obedience, or disobedience. And really, there are only those two distinct choices for us. And they both have to do with where our hearts are from where we derive our identity, where we derive our sense of self-worth. Accept or reject God, obey or disobey Jesus. Our possessions really are not necessarily possessions as such, but anything that draws us or distracts us from God. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And our hearts are most tuned to God when we are obedient to God. So it is a heart disciplined in obedience that makes one a disciple. Os Guinness, in his book, The Call, writes, the response of the disciples to the call of Jesus was not a confession of faith, but an act of obedience. They did not consider his claims make up their minds, and then decide whether to follow him or not, they simply heard and obeyed. J.I. Packer says that God's call quickens the dead, causing us to ask these questions about our own faith. Does God's call quicken that which is dead in us? Does it move us from self-improvement to total transformation by God? Does it cause us to reconsider how we are spending our lives? Does it cause us to put our treasure where we want our hearts to be, finally? Does it cause us to commit fully to a community, 
to, that will shape and influence and love us into being all that God created us to be. This week, my favorite Anglican Bible teacher, Michael Green, died. I got to know Michael through Whitcliffe Hall at Oxford, and when he and the Anglican Institute's uh, leader, Michael Marshall, led the Anglican Communion's decade of evangelism in the 90s. Uh, so Michael and I had the same Greek New Testament. The difference was he could read his. <laughs> but it, it looked just like this. And, and he would open it up and just begin to read the scripture. And you would be mem mesmerized. And your heart would be filled to the brim. He was a wonderful teacher. Uh, and he would confront always our human failure with divine restoration. He would say, the message was always just simply this. As human beings, we experience life as a kind of death. We are alienated and need reconciliation. We are sinners who need forgiveness. That was simply our situation. And he would say, Jesus is solu the solution to our problems. Jesus was resurrected and offers new life. Jesus is the means of our reconciliation. Christ, the sinless one, became sin for us. And our obedience to, to Christ, Michael Green says, invokes a great exchange. We give Christ our death, and he gives his resurrection life to us. We give him our alienation from God, and he gives us his relationship to God. We give him our sin, and he gives us his righteousness. Of course, all of this involves sort of a getting over ourselves, and obedience is the discipline that actually dissolves the pride that separates us from God. In, uh, it is the humility of Peter and the disciples that best illustrates answering God's command to put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter says, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when Simon Peter saw both boats filled with fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Richard Simons, um, in his book, listen to the title of this book, it's a terrific title, The Power of a Humble Life, Quiet Strength in an Age of Arrogance. And he writes of Chuck Colson's response to reading in Mere Christianity when C.S. Lewis writes, Pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment. So Chuck Colson apparently wrestled with this, but in humility he finally prayed this, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I accept you. Please come into my life. I commit it to you. So Colson described the moment that he said that prayer in this way, he says, with these words came a sureness of mind that matched the depth of feeling in my heart. There came something more, strength and serenity, a wonderful new assurance about life, a fresh perception of myself and the world around me. In the process, I felt old fears, tensions, and animosities draining away. I was coming alive to things I'd never seen before, as if God was filling the barren void I'd known for so many months, filling it to the brim with a whole new kind of awareness. Being filled to the brim with a new kind of awareness is exactly what happened to the disciples when their nets were filled to the brim. To be filled to the brim is God's promise and power. And each of us uh, must choose, must make a choice. We must utter a prayer. To whom do we look for eternal life, if not Jesus? 
To whom do we go to restore us to God, if not Jesus? To whom do we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, if not Jesus? Would you like to be filled to the brim? Would you like to have a living faith to share with others that you might actually invite them to come with you to church? To have even a coherent word of faith for your own family? If so, I ask you to simply repeat after me the words Chuck Colson prayed. This is very un-Anglican, but I'm asking you to do this. Lord Jesus, I believe you. I accept you. Please come into my life. I commit it to you. Amen. I believe in one, one God, God, the, the Father, Father.